Thanks, everybody. I think uh, it's, uh, it's a great ending to the first day of the conference uh, to have Christian Moeller in with us tonight. Uh, it's been a fantastic uh, uh, group of presentations today, and, uh, and many of the things Christian will be showing this evening are going to be building upon some of the things that the presentations um, have been working with over the course of the day. <coughs> um, if, if, uh, if, like me, you're comfortable with the idea of judging a book by its comp cover, this is a very, very good book. It is a book that documents the first 12 or 13 years of Christian's practice uh, in his studio, first in Europe and then uh, in the years when he moves over to the States in 2001. <coughs> um, it's, it's a great cover, not just because it was a project by Lars Müller, and turned into quite a beautiful object on its own with a kind of perforated screen. I don't know if it's laser cut or punched technology that makes it, but I think for me as an architect, and I'm sure this was part of the strategy with the project itself, putting the words time and place prominently on the top, um, and as the two kind of words that um, supposedly the arrival and proliferation of new media put under threat in our world today, buildings and spaces being in time and having a place um, is clearly a topic that Christian has been exploring in many ways through his work over the last decade and a half now. <coughs> it's, a, it's a pleasure, and I've said this uh, in the last couple of days in different ways, it's a pleasure also to welcome someone who's trained as an architect and in fact whose body of work depends in some fundamental way on, on an ability to think through space and architectural possibilities, who makes the decision early in his career to step away from what was defined then, and many people would still call a kind of traditional form of architecture. In fact, to move away from buildings as they're often referred to and to work in other areas that relate the senses that we associate with the perception of space, sound and light and haptic properties to an entirely different body of work and projects which in fact go back and try and challenge some of architecture's ongoing assumptions about what built space is. <coughs> uh, I think there are many things in Christian's work which make it a really remarkable um, and sustained project. For me, I think one of his, one of the recurring insights, um, if you look through the body of projects, is his ability to, um, to conceive of projects and then think through a wide range of technical solutions to try and sort out what makes the best sense for a given um, sort of intervention. He did a series of projects about five years ago called Bitwalls, which are remarkable in part because they go through a series of steps, but, but, and especially for students, it's an incredible lesson in trying to solve a problem, in that case a kind of digital switching on and off of a surface through at times incredibly simple mechanical means, which are then tested in different stages um, and tested alongside more complex electronic versions um, which have been evolving in several versions of that project built from the time he started it in the late 90s. Um, there are several examples of, of that kind of thinking in this book and in all of the kind of projects he'll be showing today. It was a great pleasure for us in the DRL to get a chance to go spend an evening with Christian in the Hollywood Hills of Los Angeles last Christmas time where with a couple of bottles of champagne he treated us to a pretty good tour of, uh, of an incredible series of projects um, in an almost unimaginable setting to work in as a studio, which is to try and focus on these things while looking at the city of Los Angeles below you, um, something he's also an incredible expert at. Um, Christian studied architecture originally at the College of Applied Sciences in Frankfurt and then at the Academy of Fine Arts in Vienna. And in 1990, met Peter Weibel and joined the Institute for Neue Media and began really a series of projects that leads to the kinds of things that he'll be showing tonight. In the mid-90s, he headed the Archimedia Research Institute of the College of Design in Linz and was a professor at the State College of Design in Karlsruhe before moving to the United States in 2001, where he is currently a professor at the Department of Design Media Arts at UCLA, which is quickly presenting itself as the leading faculty and institute exploring the possibilities of new media and their technologies. Um, and he currently lives and works in Hollywood, California. It's my pleasure to welcome Christian Moller.
Brett, that was a really nice introduction. I'm so proud of myself. <laughs> um, how shall I start? I mean, uh, we are here in an architecture school, so probably I give you some of my insights. <coughs> what made me walk away from being an architect? Uh, one thing I hated about architecture was that the projects they took so long. I can't work on something what goes over five or ten years. I had a practice in, a, in an architecture studio in uh, South Germany, in Stuttgart, called Benisch and Partner. Some of you might know this architecture studio. <coughs> they became famous when they built the Olympic Stadium in Munich. And uh, being there, kind of successful, I mean, being in an environment where you have probably 60 to 80 young colleagues, same age you are, um, gives you a good a opportunity to, to, to look at yourself where you are. Yeah? And there, it was pretty easy for me to figure out that I'm do I was doing okay, but there were for sure six or seven of my colleagues so far more talented than I was. That, uh, and that only in that one studio, that gave me kind of the idea that it's probably not the best thing to continue and, um, and I wanted to do something else. And the other thing I didn't appreciate very much in the world of architecture, that was that uh, for some reason, that would be another conference, architects love to hang out with other architects. And uh, they meet at schools like this, where they become boyfriend and girlfriend, then they marry, and then they get children, and they become architects, and it's all <coughs> architects. And, um, and uh, that makes you kind of a lonesome rider in a way. And, uh, and uh, so I didn't want to do this. I had uh, other plans for my life. I wanted to have... Uh, interaction with the with a bigger variety of creative or talented people and uh, that finally made me move somewhere else and as computer came uh, became they occurred on the horizon in the very late na 80s through at that time this <coughs> very fancy company silicon graphics uh, and first time you were able to do graphics on a computer screen, move them around in real time. So I found that intriguing, found that a, a, also a good idea to, if you start, if you move into another direction, <coughs> it's probably not a stupid thing to go where not so many people are already. And so that was a pretty pragmatic decision and, uh, and I don't apologize too much so far, uh, even if I get a little tired of these computers. What you probably are going to see in my presentation that I do. Um, that was my first project here, this image on the screen. Um, uh, not knowing anything, uh, I wanted to, I had this great idea, I wanted to sample the sound of the growing grass. That didn't go anywhere, but <laughs> made some really nice photography and, uh, and <laughs> I'm still kind of happy to show it. Um, the, um, I'm starting with, the, with this project, uh, don't ask me why, it's, a, it's, a, it's one project of, a, of a, actually a large amount of uh, audio installations I did in my past. I was wondering sometimes why I did so many audio installations, probably because in the uh, early 90s they were the cheapest to make, um, as computer graphics were still very expensive. and. Uh, and doing audio in real time was, was an intriguing thing. So I spent a lot of time doing this. The other reason, as you all know, uh, projected images in uh, public space under daylight conditions is a difficult thing. And uh, if you think through projects, whenever you have a chance for it, it, uh, it, it happens that the uh, you see that uh, the only thing you can actually do in a 
meaningful in, in we can do meaningful in, 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 in a sort of context is only through audio because you don't want to wait until the sun goes down. Your visitors are very often gone already at that time. So this is a project I was invited in 98 for a huge exhibition uh, in Germany on the history of German parliamentarism uh, in, sorry, in 1848, uh, the first House of Parliament in Germany was founded in this church, the Paulskirche in Frankfurt. And uh, 150 years later, there was a huge celebration of that day, the first, let's say, peak of democracy in Germany. And uh, they had a huge exhibition in a museum under the scene, spent a lot of effort, and uh, the director of this museum, Helmut Seemann, became a little afraid towards the end that uh, an exhibition on the history of German democracy or parliamentarism might be a little too, too uh, not sexy enough to, to attract huge crowds into the museum. He was scared that he ends up only with the school kids brought in buses by teachers. And uh, so he asked me to make a piece in public space for this exhibition, what becomes a kind of a propaganda piece for the thing, because the exhibition was actually much better than anyone would expect. Uh, and, w uh, and so I, <coughs> I had to do something on, 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 on German parliamentarism and uh, this image shows you the first House of Parliament in 1848 in Germany under the President Heinrich von Gagem. <laughs> and what I did, I, I made a, a structure of t steel posts, like a forest of steel posts. They are all touch sensitive. And uh, each of these poles is named by, with the name of uh, one German politician, half of them with politicians from this first House of Parliament 150 years ago and uh, the other half by contemporary famous uh, popular uh, politicians. And um, we sampled the current ones uh, with, their, with some of their significant speeches. Uh, the uh, old fellows, they, there, was a, there was a nice coincidence. The, at the same time in 1845, uh, the uh, the, the stenography, this short form writing, do you say stenography in, in English, was invented by a German guy called Schulze and he used this first <coughs> house of parliament as his laboratory to improve his, uh, his uh, uh, recording technique. So every word ever spoken in this parliament was recorded. It was very easy then to get some actors and, uh, and, uh, and uh, recording these, those, those speeches. And so while you were w walking now through through this forest of steel posts, by touching these poles, uh, these politicians started immediately talking. And when many people did that at the same time, it, uh, they were all talking at the same time, all on top of each other, kind of a little confusion. Um, but it became an interesting environment, uh, and that was my goal, how rhetorics and uh, uh, the culture of language has changed over 150 years because it was so evident when you were touching one pole that that was a contemporary one or, uh, or from the older days. The good thing with these politicians, they have all the, I mean, they are up to now, they have the same format of presentation, right? They talk into this microphone and they are all, you like them or you hate them, they are decent speakers. And uh, so that was, a, that was a beautiful thing. There was a side effect. Uh, in the system that children could also use it to make it more a kind of a rap music instrument by touching these poles and other rhythms like meine Herren, meine Herren, guten Morgen, guten Morgen, and so they were playing music. It was kind of cute. <laughs> <coughs> it was not the first time that I used these, these, uh, these pole structures for work. Uh, first time I did it, I did it in Japan at Spiral Art Center, very beautiful space by the architect Fumi Gomaki. And here it's a pure musical instrument. And I show you a little video how we develop these things. 
This is a one to this is a one to uh, twenty scale model of the installation, and I had to build it for my composer, who's Ludger Brummer, a very amazing computer musician. Uh, was based in London for a long time. Now he's running the ZKM in Karlsruhe, the audio department. He wanted to have a structure that he can place his audio elements sp spatially. When he wanted to have a, a simulation of this installation instead of doing it with a keyboard. That was an interesting task. On the right hand side you see my lighting director Nathan Thompson. On the left Wolfgang Schemmert, our electronic engineer. And here you see people wandering around in this space, touching these poles uh, to play this musical instrument. At night time, this structure is surrounded by a, a large group of single profile, profile spotlights. <clears throat> and they are all shining the same square into the structure, perfectly aligned. And by touching these poles, you are switching the light positions. That's all it does, additional to the sound. And that creates these light and shadow textures on the floor into the structure. <clears throat> it, is a, it is interesting how... How, um, <clears throat> how you become an expert with these non-linear or interactive unpredictable predictable installations. Um, the audio part is a, is a problem by itself to guarantee a harmonic potential if you don't know what will happen uh, the next moment is, a, is something after trying many many things and doing boring or wrong things we came up with something uh, uh, what is now working all the time using genetic algorithms to grow sounds for these purposes but you always <coughs> there's plenty of potential to still make mistakes um, and sometimes you discover them really late in this case I mean we tried it out so many times and it was all working great until the day of the opening and I knew that it doesn't matter how many people are going to come because I was prepared that our audio system will work no matter what. <clears throat> but the system was organized that way that if you touch one pole um, you were creating one sound but touching two poles you we, we had a, an algorithm that was transponding the overall audio experience one octave up or down to make it more dynamic made perfect sense and it worked great. But having all these people there at the same time, what I didn't expect is that everybody was touching two poles at the same time for some weird reason. And that screwed this audio experience up in a big way um, in the middle of the opening. And um, so, but you get this experience. And so what, what I did, I, I, I was running up into the office of the gallery and uh, I printed a, a quick description uh, on A4 paper, uh, how that works it was totally redundant because it was obvious how it works. So then we printed it out as, ma as many as we could and, and then we brought it down and handed it out to the people on the display. And from this moment on, everybody had the sheet of paper in his hand and was w touching <laughs> only with one. <laughs> that's, that's how you do. Um, that is a, a little installation, uh, so simple, um, but I still like to show it um, because that was the teaser how to get the people into the gallery. Um, had a <coughs> Aoyama is this uh, uh, part of, uh, of Tokyo where you have all the famous fashion companies uh, like Izzy Miyake, Comme des Garçons, they're all there. Yamamoto and uh, people love to look in the shopping windows and this gallery has uh, also huge glass facades not much going on in the lobby and so I, I placed an installation there where, where they couldn't see the display but they couldn't s they could see people doing for no reason weird things in the lobby and I wanted to attract them to come in uh, to find out why people are doing this.
These girls are filmed by a hidden camera. They don't, they don't know that they are recorded. And it, sh it shows how, I mean, this is, this is what I'm always trying, that the, if we do interactive work, that there's no need for us to explain people how, how it works, that they, they just find it out by themselves. And they usually do. So another <coughs> uh, forest of steel poles, I did this in, I think it was in 2003 at, uh, in Graz. Uh, purpose was the European Cultural Capital Program, uh, what was in 2003 Graz. Um, maybe you know uh, the, the Vito Aconci thing, island kind of coffee house there in the river or Peter Cook's, I, I don't know if Peter Cook's uh, thing was part of it, but probably it was, um, it was. So I, I had an opportunity to do something in the, in the backyard of a, no, not in the, in the courtyard of a, of a beautiful castle. Um, and it uh, wanted to fit the, the context of, uh, of the, 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 the myth of the Tower of Babel, the confusion of tongues, the Genesis 9 uh, Bible story. And uh, <coughs> what I'm doing here, I'm using them again, same way, touch sensitive. Here it's just really nasty difficult because to make such an installation outdoors, but you're expecting snow and heavy rain, makes, turns it into a totally diff different task. Um, what, I, what we are doing here, we are receiving, no, we are representing all languages we can receive uh, via satellite dish on the northern hemisphere. And each of these languages is represented by one pole and the country of origin of the language. And when you touch it, this radio state channel is broadcasting into this courtyard. And then the same thing, if a lot of people are doing it at the same time, it gets this confusion of tongues. <coughs> Here was a strange coincidence that that they, I mean, we were working, I had this commission, let's say, for three or four years. That was pretty long. The, and the day of the opening, the bombs were falling on Babylon, right? And everybody was standing around this pole of Iraq, uh, listening to really dull propaganda music. And the day after the opening, that pole became silent, never, never broadcasted anything anymore. Strange coincidence. <coughs> this is another poll, just a single one. It's probably the last one I I gonna do. It's over with the polls. Uh, this is this is one I did here in London, invited by uh, the Science Museum uh, through Hannah Redler, who's sitting here with us tonight, um, and uh, it's part of an art show uh, about energy and. Uh, it took me a while to find a good idea what I could do with energy. Hannah encouraged me in a way that she said uh, well, we, it would be great if we could make energy with an installation. We could turn it into a physical experience. And then, then this was what I came up with, a very simple thing called do not touch. And when you touch it, you get electrocuted. pretty much it. <laughs> it was a, I have to say, I, I, half the way I didn't believe that we can put such a thing into the museum <laughs> because there were some heavy uh, safety issues and concerns and Hannah somehow made it fly. Uh, I, was, I think it was a ton of paperwork, uh, but uh, it went through, it was great. Um, here, um, a work after I did this thing with the politicians. I mean, um, 
what I showed in the beginning. Somehow, I mean, sooner or later, all of these uh, contemporary politicians, they showed up in Frankfurt and they wanted to see what I'm doing with them in my little installation. And so somehow that, I, I don't know if they liked it or not, but the <coughs> that made me occur on their, on their horizon. And um, all of a sudden I got a morning, seven o'clock in the morning, I got a phone call from the director of the Museum of German History. And he asked me if, I'm, if I would be interested in do a sound installation in the in Norman Foster's dome on top of the Reichstag in Berlin. And uh, of course I said yes. And, uh, and then he said yes, but um, that's good, but um, you have to find a way to exhibit the third national symbol. And uh, I had no idea what the third national symbol is. And then he was talking to me like a general from his horse to a soldier that the first national symbol, everybody know, should know this, are the colors of the country. You, all of you know for sure. The second one is the, is, the, is the symbol of the country. We have this eagle, what looks more like a fat hen <laughs> to me. Um, and then uh, the third one is the, is the national anthem. So they wanted me to find a way how to bring in the, national, the German national anthem into this dome. And even the, let's say, the, the, the most conservative backbencher in the House of Parliament would know that you can't play it through loudspeakers, which is just ridiculous, right? And uh, so how, how do you do that? And, um, <coughs> and so I came up with this funny idea to just put a metal plate in the entrance area of this dome, have that flash integrated into the uh, concrete floor, and then beautiful metal and uh, just the name of the German national anthem, what is das Lied der Deutschen, and then uh, composer Haydn, text by Fallersleben. So that was the idea. And then having, it <coughs> having that thing sitting on feather springs. Feather springs are these um, mechanical parts which you find in every factory where they have to separate the heavy uh, industrial machines from the concrete of the building for not getting the vibration of the machines into the structure. And then in the center of, of that plate, I wanted to have a very heavy duty um, sound. Uh, it's actually just an actuator. It's not even a sound actuator. It's a vibrator, if you want. Uh, an interesting technology that's the inventor of this sort of uh, technology is what's originally, originally made as a sound canceling system for the German high speed train, the ICE. You know that there's this beautiful competition going on with the TGV in France, the, uh, the, the Shinkansen in Japan, and then this German train, all great trains. The German one has a funny technical problem at, had at, th at that time. Um, what I, I, I love this story so much. Uh, the thing is, <coughs> when you have a train, you have these sleepers underneath of the rails, right? And these sleepers, they are in a regular distance of each other. Uh, they don't necessarily need to be so regular in distance because, I mean, the track is strong enough to support it anyway. But in Germany, they are to the tenth of the millimeter, they are in the exact <laughs> same distance. And, um, and, um, and then, I mean, the, you understand when the, when the train is going along the tracks, it makes a little hill and valley sort of performance on the rails. And this, because it's so damn regular, it, it transforms the wheel into a sort of triangular sh shape from the circle. Would never happen if it would be unregular. Um, and, the, and, the, and, the, and then having this wheel in this kind of little deformation plays a kind of sound on the on the rails, and here came the bad luck, bad, bad luck into play that this vibration caught the resonance frequency of this aluminum chassis of the train at a certain speed. I don't know where the speed is, 130 miles per hour or something like that. And that makes a ton of noise. I mean, this is not loud. This is how somebody said it's the kind of sound 
what makes your inlays falling out of your teeth kind of sound. And, they, and so they, <laughs> and they, and they had to do something with this. And so his idea, Tillmann Freudenberg's idea was to measure these vibrations in real time because they can't change the wheels all the time, it's too expensive. Um, uh, to measure this frequency in real time and then vibrate the exact fr same frequency back into the train, just shift it half an amplitude and then canceling this noise out of the system. Was not taken. I heard about it, I loved it a lot and, uh, and, uh, and I asked him, hey, can we play the German national anthem with this thing? And, uh, <laughs> and, uh, and uh, so, the, so we, the idea was we wanted to trans, trans, uh, transform the, 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 the melody into a frequency between 0 and 200 hertz. And then having this plate there vibrating. And because it's perforated, it does not make any sound. It's completely 100% silent. You, you can't even really see that it's moving. And the moment you step on that thing, then it vibrates the German national anthem in your body. And, um, <laughs> And if you want to, you can close your ears, and then your skull becomes the resonance body for this kind of melody. And you, you can hear the melody. And uh, so I found that a cool concept. I had to present it at the House of Parliament, in front of all these people. And was, I showed pretty much the same pictures, and I, and I concluded with this sentence, what I found really, really smart. There was a, this is a variation of the German national anthem, what moves you physically without creating any pathos. And they started to throw rotten tomatoes on my head. They just went absolutely ballistic in this place. <laughs> they, hated, they hated it so much, I can't express you how much they hated it. <laughs> <laughs> then uh, through Hannah Redler again, I had a chance a year later then to realize it here in London, but we are not playing the German national anthem. <laughs> Uh, it is electronic music by Ludger Brummer. Um, this is uh, my first work I did in my new hometown, uh, Los Angeles. I got a very beautiful invitation from Caltech, California Institute of Technology, what is a fantastic research center for its size, absolutely amazing place probably for its size the number one engineering research center in the United States of America. <coughs> they have more Nobel Prize winners there working than I have graduate students in my program. And, um, and they asked me to, to, to make an artwork for them. I could do whatever I want to. The only condition is I have to use some of their technology. I have to incorporate that into the work. And um, and uh, when you, I'm from Frankfurt, uh, that's not the most loving place on earth. You move to Hollywood and it can happen that you get a little overwhelmed by this, by this omnipresence of happiness and all these smiling people. Um, <laughs> and uh, so, <laughs> So I, <coughs> I invited, I made a casting call, I invited uh, six uh, professional actresses. Uh, they all should, they was, they, they're supposed to have a news anchor background, not all of them had it then. Um, and I made them smile into a video camera for as long as they could, up to one and a half hour. <laughs> Continuous smile. And, um, and while they were smiling into this camera, this super sophisticated computer system by Caltech and the Machine Perception Laboratories of the University of San Diego was scrutinizing the sincerity of their smile. <laughs> and, and whenever that went on their threshold, it, got a little, uh, it made a little alert signal to them to be more happy. Right? <laughs> and that shows you a uh, little sequence out of the recording session.
That's the first minute of the recording. They're all still happy. And then this is after one and a half hour. <laughs> but look how she comes back, huh? We are making a lot of fun here, but the <laughs> I have to say, nobody here in this room is able to make that thing silent for longer than 10 seconds. I mean, these actresses, they are really amazing. They, the only way how they can do this is by making themselves happy thoughts, because this is, the system works <coughs> in a, stunningly well, and uh, just performing this, this face feature was not enough. I mean, there was more about it. Well, you got the idea, I guess. Um, now I want to show you some, uh, some ongoing projects or work in progress. This is a uh, thing I have since long on the plate. I don't know that why it's so mo moving so slow. Uh, it's, a, it's a very challenging commission I've got totally by coincidence in, uh, in Karlsruhe, South Germany. I went to a restaurant, Italian restaurant, for lunch. And there was a friend sitting, uh, a movie director, together uh, with the mayor of the city. And they invited me to their table, joined them for lunch. And uh, this movie director introduced me as a guy who does stuff with bitmap graphics. You mentioned it before. I, unfortunately, I'm not showing so much of it. Um, uh, and then the mayor became immediately excited about it and told me, well, we have here this project where we have to build all these sound absorbing walls along our freeways. Um, it's all engineered out, uh, priced out, but they look terrible. If you find a way to make these things look more successful without increasing the budget, not a single penny, you get the commission. And uh, so I gave it a try. And um, if, you, if, if, if you work on, a, on an existing bu budget already and it is engineered out, <coughs> It is probably a good idea to reinvent this thing completely from scratch, and that's what I tried. Uh, to cancel the sound, uh, it's interesting, a lot of people don't know that, that the, all the sound the cars make on the road is not the engine of the car. It is at a certain speed higher than 40 miles per hour. It's actually the, the rubber, the, the tire on the road, what makes the sound. And, um, and so you have to cancel that out somehow. And so I came up with these horizontal slats as an idea. And, uh, and, and then I wanted to bite them out here and there. Uh, and then when these structures are hit by the direct sunlight, they create these bitmap portraits sitting in the landscape. That was the plan. And then uh, I got an opportunity to, uh, I was commissioned by the Art Museum in Frankfurt to build a kind of a prototype in one-to-one -one scale for their facade for an exhibition and, uh, and that shows here. These are the, the uh, concrete prototypes we built for it. So it's all about the shadow underneath of these elements and they create the image, right? This is a rendering of it to show how that performs over the time and the year. I mean, it stays, of course, always the same image, right? But it changes with the sun position, gives it a different ductus. And then here, how it, uh, uh, a low res rendering, how it would look in the landscape. Um, working on it, I, I, I did a few more of these works here in the gallery show, uh, where I do it with the male portraits. Um, 
was kind of beautiful. So we are converting the image into these lists of coordinates and uh, then we had a amount of friendly helpers to, to, to put these little chips uh, into the exact, almost exact coordinate to create the image. While doing it I've realized that there were a lot of chips um, and uh, then there was a time for two weeks where I didn't show up because I didn't want to meet them uh, because I felt really guilty for a moment. But then when it was done everybody was happy and uh, it turned out a really beautiful show. So all about the shadow underneath of the little chip, right? And all these faces uh, I casted, I wanted to have very strong male faces and uh, sometimes I'm, I'm very pragmatic and so I contacted a, a, a prison in Germany because I thought there I find them the easiest and, uh, and uh, they are all portraits we shot in this prison. In reality it was much nicer, the video doesn't capture it so, so well. So that's one example of these bit walls I did. This is a work which uh, is uh, almost, uh, which is going to be, how you call it, finished very soon. In um, I think in March we're gonna, we are going to set it up in in uh, in Seattle. Um, this is the, the maintenance facility for the public transportation system, but it's mostly based on buses. There they repair the buses and it's a huge parking lot for, uh, I've forgotten how many, but more than 1,000 huge buses. And as a nature of the, of the system, these buses are always on the road. And, uh, and then you have just this huge em empty parking lot uh, and um, and they asked me if I could build a, a, a par par perimeter, perimeter around it um, to give it more of a physical presence. Uh, and uh, but they had up, they had no money. And um, and so what I came up with uh, was to just put a ordinary chain link fence there, and uh, and click plastic chips into the chain link fence. And these plastic chips. They, jump, they then create the bitmap graphics. So this image, uh, as a, as a, there was a very early, just how we call it, tryout, uh, is assembled out of ten thousand of these plastic chips. That's my daughter. That's, uh, sometimes I work very analog, um, uh, just to check the resolution if it works uh, according to the street profile. I have uh, this old endoscope and I just print it out, put it there, look through the endoscope and then I know that it works. I, sometimes I, I don't know, I'm, I'm not trusting the computers too much. And, um, and this, this is the, the, the final images we're going to put there. So it's people reading the magazines. While I think that's one of the significant things about public transportation so that it gives you the op I mean, here in London, it's redundant to talk about it, of course, I know. But in Los Angeles, it's not. And, uh, there are, and then there, uh, besides of not using public transportation, there are also people who are refusing to read the magazine or the newspapers, and they are even proud of it. So I, I uh, found that a, an interesting theme. And this is the, the, uh, uh, the prototype we built it on my fabricator's facility. So you see the little plastic guys sitting there. And it's actually kind of stunning. Uh, how, uh, what kind of depth these, these images create. And so this is uh, six meters high and uh, nine meters long. In reality, it will be, I don't know, really, really long, <coughs> like this. So it's just this little part here, what we had at the mock-up. So I'm looking forward. And it was almost for free. I mean, it was the cheapest thing I've ever, I ever did, I guess. Um, here, another, another work. Uh, brand new, 
um, for the, uh, the airport uh, of Seattle, they are building a light rail station and um, a light rail from downtown to the airport and they have to connect the station somehow to the terminal and there are two pedestrian bridges and they wanted me to think about these pedestrian bridges. Um, and uh, here I just, I mean you, there's so many things you can make with a walkway. I mean you're not running out of uh, ideas but when you, when you try to do something what uh, mm -hmm. works somehow from inside and from outside at the same time, then uh, you all of a sudden you are realizing that there are not so many options anymore. And, uh, and that was what I came up with. I wanted to create kind of portals through the walkway. Uh, and having these portals uh, facing the outside with the surface of uh, colored laminated glass. And then I mean that's the uh, elevation of the of the pedestrian bridge. Underneath there's a there's a heavy uh, traffic uh, freeway. And then my first idea was to animate something like that on this colored glass, just a, a, a black bar going along, looping there. And uh, because the the walkway is so 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 long, I thought that. Doing this with the little carts, with the luggage, that becomes a kind of a logistic nightmare anyways for them. And so why not, like in a ski lift, you know, ha have something hanging from the ceiling and you, you hook your piece of luggage on it and, and then it just oh, like a conveyor belt, right? And, then, and so you just follow your luggage. And on the opposite side, I wanted to have this shadow object here in the sketch. And this shadow object then passing through the light, what is reflected through a mirror onto the frosted glass panel would then create a shadow on the thing. Found that a good idea, but then I got scared. Um, I mean, everybody loved it, but then I know for sure, sooner or later, somebody would have come up with this idea that what happens if a terrorist puts a bomb there, right, and drives it right into the airport uh, while not walking next to it? That would be too easy to blow that place up. And, uh, and that for sure they would have, uh, they would have um, they they would not have agreed with this, so I had I had to come with something else, and then I thought about I mean what 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 the only thing what worries you if you go to an airport is time. I mean you are either too early or you have to wait for too long. I mean it's all all about the time. Uh, the other thing is all about weather, right? I mean that's not so much your worry. That's more the worry of these flight control people, and uh, and uh, I mean your windshield wiper, let's say, as a, as a good picture for it. So if you put that to the pendulum and the windshield wi wiper together, then you get something maybe like a metronome. So now, now I thought, OK, we do metronome um, like this. And so when it rains, then uh, you have these windshield wipers created by shadow uh, uh, on, on these glass panels. So and in Seattle, it rains all the time, so so found it funny. I don't know, you don't find it funny. <laughs> <laughs> um, that's a, uh, that's a, a, a thing I do. Damn, I've forgotten the name. It's a small community in Washington. I've forgotten the name. Um, this is a pump station for, for a water treatment facility. Um, and um, I got a, a huge commission from them. The beautiful with thing with this commission is that they, I mean they, they bury for billions of dollars uh, pipes underground for this water treatment thing. Uh, so there's almost nothing above ground. And uh, so I can do pretty much what I want. Uh, but this is the starting point. This is the this, the pump station, and they said you can do whatever you want in the other area. But if you would do something on our pump station, it would be great. We would love that. And um, and so I thought about it, and uh, and I take I st I told them well, but I want to save my money for the for for what I can do maybe at the ocean. I mean they 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 collect the water, the the wastewater. They 
put it to a treatment facility and then they pump it back into the ocean. And I said, well, well I want to do something at the ocean. And so so if, if I do it here at the pump station, you have to give me some architectural credit for this because I don't want to waste all my money there. And I told them, so then take this guy here away um, and replace it, by a tall, replace it by a taller structure like this. Um, and then they give me the credit for this, for this architectural part, which I removed um, some of the technical things I have in, inside this vertical thing. And then so, so I don't have to pay so much out of my budget for that. Um, telling them that uh, if it's a pump station, we, 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 a tower makes sense because um, the, the old ways to get pressure on the water was always done by these water towers. And uh, if you, you go to a website and look in water tower, and you get millions of images. People love these water tower structures. That's this uh, famous one in Chicago, <coughs> beautiful, beautiful piece of architecture. So, so it's something like that I, 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 I wanted to propose. And um, it of course, it doesn't make any sense to make a real water tower there. So, so I was going more in towards the containers of, of uh, drinking water. What I found an interesting thing to think about. I mean, there are, you go <laughs> to a supermarket and you see uh, all these water companies uh, competing with each other, trying to sell you th the exact same product, which they were just, let's say, taking out of the ground anyway for nothing. Right? So, and they sell you this. They make this really big branding competition. Competition. <coughs> they bottle the water in France and then sh they ship it to uh, the United States. While probably a ship from the United States with another water brand called Arrowhead is on the, its way to Europe, and then you meet in the middle of the ocean with two ships of water, and they can say, "Hi." <laughs> um, and the Germans started this <laughs> insanity. I didn't know that uh, before I, I, I went here into this project. Apollinaris was the company who did it first. They shipped 50 million of these bottles in 1850 to the United Kingdom already. The bottle has changed, right? <laughs> but the, the corporate identity is still the same. I find that stunning. Yeah. Uh, then, I mean, you find, these, I mean, because they have to try so hard to make the water sort of fancy, they make all these bottles. Hideous bottles. And uh, so, so I want to crash them. And a lot of them, and uh, found a company in Utah in the United States. What can melt them then into these rocks? And they tumble these rocks, uh, then they get they, they they become very beautiful objects. Like uh, if you find a piece of glass at the beach, you know this is uh, so very smooth, beautiful objects. And um, I want to make a structure like this out of this shredded glass. Um, uh, it's, it's held back by a stainless steel mesh against a perforated steel sheet. What is the structural element in the thing? And then we just light it with fluorescent lights from the back. Makes very, very beautiful patterns, which are not so great here in the video, but uh, you get the idea, right? And then I want to have it standing there, and that's all. And uh, we, we, we switch, we dim the fluorescent lights a little bit and I zoom a little bit, I'm not fast, very slowly, just a little bit. Another one I'm doing right now, I showed it, uh, I showed it uh, when uh, your student group came to, uh, to my studio. It's one I, I like a lot, it's for the harbor of uh, San, uh, for the, hub, the LA Harbor, Los Angeles Harbor, called San Pedro. Um, and when you drive <laughs> down the Los Angeles areas, you see plenty of these machines sitting in the hills, digging for oils. For, for oil, uh, they're not terribly well painted, but they're beautiful little guys. They're always, always everywhere in the hills, moving, very cute. Or they, you have uh, plenty of those machines sitting in the ocean, also digging for oil. I don't want to make here a big statement about the ecological 
issues with, with these sort of facilities, but they, they look absolutely great. And they, at night, when they are lit, they're beautiful structures. And then uh, when you do something at the harbor, it doesn't take you long, and you get the idea, oh, maybe I should do something with a lighthouse. So that's very obvious. Um, this is the LA lighthouse, it's a tiny little guy. And then at the harbor, finally, you have these cranes, these gigantic machines moving these millions of containers around. Most of the containers, meanwhile, from China. And I heard this amazing story. Um, guess who's the biggest country in, in Chinese imports? Of course, the United States. Not a big surprise, right? Second is Japan. No surprise either. Third is Germany. No surprise. Number four is Walmart. <laughs> and number five is the United Kingdom. That, I, find that, I find that kind of insane. Yeah? Walmart. So you have, these, you have these machines standing there. So I, I wanted to make something between beacon and machine. And so I, I go with the, such a weldering robot. It's called Fanuk 420. Um, here, I mean, we have the, all this tradition in California with the, with the robots and the humans. And the, but if you, if, you, if, you, if you see them performing, at their workplace. They are so beautiful to watch. They, these are so strong, but so careful machines, right? So anthropomorphic in their motion performance. I never get tired of watching these guys. They, they, they have so much character. Love them. And then I've learned that you can dress them up. This is the, <laughs> this is, this the, this is the, the, the spray, paint, spray paint booth at Ferrari in Italy. <laughs> And uh, so what I'm going to do, I have a huge pedestal, and I put the guy on top of it, like this. You now I have to switch the program to, to show you what's doing. So it's sitting there, has a light in his hand, and is shining around with his light pretty much all it does. Little lonely fellow. <laughs> uh, cute, cute. Huge bastard, uh, but very, very cute and so careful. And it does that in his uh, loneliness until a passerby comes along. And then it goes back to its normal behavior, right? So that's about the robot. Now, since I started this robot thing, I want to do more of these robot, robot projects. When, when you know something where you can recommend me a site where I can do something like that, I would do it right away. I, I'm, uh, I love these machines. Here, this, uh, here we had <coughs> I went a step farther. Um, I think that won't work. But the, there is a slight chance that it might work. We want to do a, a thing with water tension. I mean, you know when you have a, a sophisticated water nozzle, you can, you can, you can spread, spray water, and it keeps its surface, its water surface, pre pretty great for, for quite a while before it breaks then uh, out. It has, it's, uh, uh, it has plenty to do with the, how careful you, uh, you, you push the water according to the size that you don't get any air and turbulences in the thing. So here we want to go a step farther. We want to have an, an el electrostatic field around the robot that it ties this, 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 wat this water surface down like a condom of water around the, around this this uh, robot, that would be absolutely great if that works. I'm I'm not sure. Um, so so I, I I'm I'm looking now for every opportunity where I can do a robot project. Where where are we in time? Yeah, not boring yet. The 
Um, I'll show you some, some of my uh, older light installations I did. This is, a, uh, this is one I did in Japan uh, in 97, I think. It was underneath of a, of a temple, uh, a Zen temple in Tokyo. And more interesting, even it was underneath of a cemetery uh, in the courtyard of this Zen temple. It was probably the most beautiful cemetery I have ever seen, the most civilized place. It's a water surface, not very deep, where the monks are cutting granite blocks, let's say eight by eight by eight centimeters, and they engrave the name of the dead person, and then they put this granite block into the water surface and they assemble them nine by nine to square plate and they are sitting then like water lilies in the, in the water. Very, very poetic, beautiful place. And underneath they have this space, uh, a, perf a, a performance, an art space, uh, what you would never find in our countries, that you combine these things. Um, and they invited me to, to do something there. And uh, so what I came up with was this water surface, this artificial water surface, and the, and the, and the strong sound insula installation, what works with micro insects underwater moving around uh, while people are manipulating the gradient of this light surface. This projection shows you the uh, simulation of the sound cluster moving in space. It, it follows a gravity algorithm according to the gradient of this light surface. People were using this space like, like a hot spring, basically. They were sitting there, like sitting in the water. For some of them, for a very long time, it turned out a very poetic environment. Here, another light installation I did in Rio de Janeiro. Um, they invited me for a show what was dealing with artificial spaces. And uh, they expected me to do some 3D computer graphics, real-time um, things, uh, but I, was, I wasn't all that interested in this at that time. And, uh, and I wanted to find another way to turn a space into a, an artificial world. And um, I designed uh, costumes with very strong light systems inside. Following the idea, if you bring a light source so unnaturally close uh, to a performer that the performer becomes the light source for the space, that should turn the an even indifferent environment into a pre-artificial uh, world. These are fluorescent lights, the smallest you could buy at that time. That's just a photo shoot. But that's the final installation. I built a, a, a shopping window situation uh, where these models were walking in a very simple uh, choreography around and uh, and that was the only light in space but I had glass in between the the visitors and uh, the performers it's not very difficult to find 
very, very beautiful uh, fashion models in Rio de Janeiro. And it was, it was a, a, a beautiful, challenging thing just to display their feet. And they, they, they enjoyed it also a lot. And these, these, these catwalk women, they have a huge feet. This one here is, um, well, things, <coughs> you know, that, 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 that work here was called Electroclips, a dance performance, an interactive dance performance from 1994. Uh, that's now 12 years ago. No, not 12, right? 11 years ago. Um, so, so we got used to it. For me, it was a very important work. It was unexpected unexpected successful uh, as I had the, the the chance to do something 100% on the right spot I mean the right time the right thing in the right place you don't have this op these opportunities very often and it's very hard to look out for them so that you need a little piece of luck to get these opportunities um, it's a dance performance with uh, Stephen Galloway. He was at that time the first dancer of William Forsythe's uh, dance company, so to say one of the most popular uh, uh, ballet dancers in the world. And um, the idea was that we created a stage perforated with light sensors and his motions in the theater lights are uh, generating the, the sound in the space. So he's, he's the conductor of an electronic orchestra with his movements and he, it's, he's not following the movement. That, that was the idea. Um, the music was composed by Pete Namluk and here's some excerpts from it. <laughs> I think you got the idea. When, <clears throat> when we, that was, uh, I mean, to make this piece was, was kind of, uh, it wasn't difficult, but to get it right adjusted, that, it, that it's um, fun to watch and that it really works, that takes forever. We had a rehearsal stage, an mm -hmm. entire theater for three months. Uh, to tune the instrument, basically. So that's uh, a luxury you have to have to, to do these things. And um, so I, I was, I, I, I was um, very honored to, had, to have this opportunity by not being a theater ma maker in any, any way. It became super successful. The, the record sold out immediately, music for ballet. 
and whenever we had it, we had a replay. It was sold out right away. It was was a was a was a beautiful thing. And um, and uh, uh, and uh, one day uh, we got visitors from. At that time, uh, I hadn't heard about this organization before. It was uh, V2 from Rotterdam, and uh, they asked me if we can if we can make such an installation in public space. In particular, they wanted to do something wanted me to do something at the mu in the museum park of uh, Rem Kolas there in Rotterdam. And uh, the park has little problems. It's a beautiful park, but uh, I mean, people don't feel safe nighttime, or at least at that time, they didn't feel safe at night in this park. I mean, drug problems or whatever makes people feeling insecure at night in urban areas. Uh, so the, the, the we wanted to get people into the park, having something like electroclips just in public space. Uh, I put again a huge hardwood floor into this park, perforated with these light sensors. And then in the, in the sunlight, people could interact with their shadows on these light sensors. At night, we had it surrounded with a uh, humongous amount of, uh, of aircraft landing lights. It became a very successful spot. I mean, it became the meeting point almost for the youth culture of Rotterdam. All the inline skaters, skateboarders, they 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 used this environment. They were regular visitors. It was a it was a that was an interesting experience and different from um, a lot of art shows I I did before to have a regular crowd. One thing what made it probably work pretty successfully was not so much on the sound side. It was um, the, uh, this, this unusual um, phenomena of having a, a wooden floor outdoors with no roof on top of it and then having plenty of halogen light on, reflected on the floor turns the environment, the outdoor environment, into something what we are usually, we, we, we only know it from indoor. Uh, 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 context and that, uh, that made it a, a kind of a likable place. <coughs> um, this is a facade I did in 1992. Um, that was my first big commission I've got uh, very early on uh, when I decided to go into this direction. It's a facade in Frankfurt. What changes its light condition according to the outside temperature? At uh, zero degrees Celsius, it's all blue. And then it, uh, the warmer it gets, the more of these yellow clusters occur. And they are then driven through the f over the facade according to the wind direction and the wind speed. Microphones pick up the street sound waves and turn them into a graphic display. That, that's only part of it. So with this project on, on the side of a building, you linked it up to temperature as well. Yeah, we linked it up to weather conditions. We have a little weather station on the roof of the building that measures temperature, wind speed, wind direction, uh, the rest light. The building reacts to people and the weather via a computer program and a rooftop meteorological station channel. The information is fed to a wall of perforated aluminium shields and the quartz halogen bulbs and coloured filters behind it. Blue illustrates cold, yellow warm, 
and the direction of the pattern is determined by which way the wind blows. It's one of the many sonic projects this artist come architect has realised, and it's probably the most tame. Hmm, probably. The, the last thing I'm going to show you is... Um, now, I stop this for a moment because I have to say, I have to say a word. Um, and I can't stop it. <coughs> I mean, you, over, over the years you're doing plenty of things, right? And you make more and more and more and more and some of them are successful, others are less successful. You show, of course, only the ones you find successful. Um, but not very often you do something that makes you proud, right? And, uh, and uh, that happened only once to me and this is this thing I'm going to show you now. This is a performance I did, was at that time the biggest video projection ever done with Oscar Zala. And Oscar Zala is the inventor of the first synthesizer in the world. He opened the, Olympic, the Olympics in 1936, this famous Nazi propaganda Olympic Games uh, with synthesizer music. So almost unbelievable. And uh, he did a lot of soundtracks for movies. He, when you see Hitchcock's birds again, just take the image off and listen to the sound, make it loud. It's all synthesizer music, not really synthesizer, it's an analog machine. He calls it Trautonium. And I was able to convince him to come to play a concert in public space. I, I created a sound system behind this, this, uh, this light wall. What had the quality, was crazy expensive, what had the quality to turn the street into a chamber music situation. It was absolutely amazing. And then I projected this huge image on, on him, uh, on the facade, and uh, he, he himself was playing only in a small studio. Uh, because he he hesitates with crowds and um, and it was a beautiful concert. the only music instrument of this kind and he's the only one in the world who can can play it One, one, reason, one reason why he does not like to perform in public is that it takes him up to 20 minutes to adjust his instruments for a new song because it's a complete analog machine that has millions of buttons. And, uh, and um, I told him that's not a problem. We're going to show sequences out of his most successful films. And I put this compilation together and that's a very beautiful sequence out of a movie he made, Voyage to a Moon. He had because of his historical context, he had really great relationships to the NASA and to all these rocket guys. And they gave him footage from the moon landing, what all went wrong on the moon, uh, on the moon what was never shown to an American audience because they found it embarrassing. And he made this beautiful uh, compilation from what all went wrong on the moon <laughs> with, his, with his music. It's fantastic. If you see that, it's amazing. Voyage to the Moon. They hear the guys. They are trying to, to to stick something in the ground to sample a bit of the dirt, <laughs> and it becomes a major problem.
Well, so that was it. Thank you very much. Thank you, Christian. Uh, you can take a question or two. Yes, yes, yes. I think maybe just to to start off, would you? Um, in I want to pick up on something you said at the very beginning of the talk, which is the question of patience and how long projects take, which is one of the ways you got into this body of work. Over the years, maybe a decade later, what do you think, 10 or 15 years later, you referred a couple of times to projects that are taking two, three, and more years. <coughs> are they returning to the architectural projects that? Uh, no. No. The, the, I, I, what I, I mean, there, there are sometimes I get a commission and it takes them five years before uh. it realizes. Uh, I've mentioned that before. Um, I hate this <laughs> totally uh, because I lose interest. Uh, of what I mean, this yeah. So it's not very it's not very pleasant. I like it when it goes quick. But the difference to architecture is that I'm not working within the four and a half years in between, and that's that's a huge yeah. difference. Yeah. How about the other? Uh, and we were talking about this briefly before you started, but the over the years, maybe just say something about the nature of the technical team you're working with. Does it vary by project? Do you have a group of people that are kind of growing and developing alongside it? or Both. How's that? Meanwhile, meanwhile this, is, um, <coughs> this is a very... I gave up my studio in Germany, so I'm not running that anymore. Um, and now it's a complete satellite system, my, <coughs> my people I cooperate with. Um, and uh, they, are, they are independent from me now completely. Uh, some of them are actually financially performing now much better than they did with me, what is great. Uh, but we, we still like each other and it's a, it's a, it's a group that what, what, uh, has now working experience over 10 years and whenever I need to form a group for a project, they're all there, they're immediately there. Uh, and uh, meanwhile, we are actually pr pretty pretty good in uh, doing a lot of work via online communication. Um, the, the reasons why we come together is actually more for, 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 for social, social things, because then it's nicer to share some experience together. But uh, most of it we can do online. And then while I'm doing this, I, of course, I meet a lot of talented people in my, in my, uh, my teaching environment, and so then become more and more people, yeah. Can we open it up to questions? Anybody have questions on this side? Or this way? Then no we'll questions. That we'll makes go sense. upstairs and have a beer together. Thank you very much. Thank Christian. you. Thanks.